Well, if you're really so determined to have a fight, then I'll oblige. <laughs> Hello there, everybody listening to this on YouTube. My name is Ben Johnson. I am the host of the Kung Fu Movie Guide podcast. Thank you all so much for listening to this conversation from our archive. The conversation you are about to hear was recorded in person here in London. It was originally released on the 22nd of October 2018. It is me talking to the writer Matthew Polly. Matthew is the author of the book Bruce Lee A Life. The Kung Fu Movie Guide podcast has been running since 2016. Over the years, I have spoken to many of the leading lights from the world of martial arts movies. You can listen back to every episode of the podcast for free right now, wherever it is that you get your podcasts. That includes places like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and many other podcast providers. Head over to our website, kungfumovieguide.com, for more information about the show, to sign up to our newsletter, to find links to donate, and to read the latest reviews and information about martial arts movies. You can also contact us via social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and you can also email me. The email address is hello at kungfumovieguide.com. I will be back at the end of this conversation to sign off properly, but until then, here we go then. This is my conversation with the great Matthew Polly. I guess the first thing that I wanted to pick up on was um, I can't believe there hasn't been a, a book like this before, like a fully comprehensive Bruce Lee biography. Yeah. Why is that, do you think? Uh, well, before I jump into that, I just want to say thanks for having me. And yeah. so your listeners know we're actually in London. Yes. This isn't some call-in. This is yeah. the real deal, face-to-face. <laughs> That's so right. pretty rare in podcasting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to note that. And thank you for having me. That's really great. Um, I think there's two issues. Why hasn't there been a proper Bruce Lee book? Uh, one is that um, I think there's a soft bigotry against Asians uh, and Asian celebrities. And how do I know that? Because there's only about three of them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In the mainstream culture. Yeah. Uh, and so they're generally ignored. Mm. It's not that they're uh, actively, anyone has some active prejudice against them, but yeah. it's just considered not important. So even when I was selling the Bruce Lee book, to people, they were like, "Well, does does anybody really want to read a Bruce Lee book? Like, will we really? sell many copies?" Yeah. And I had several rejections based on that. And I was like, "He's one of the five most famous human beings on earth." Absolutely. Like, you can't go anywhere and you don't. Someone yeah. knows Bruce Lee. They might not want to read the book, but they know who he is. Yeah. And there are only a few people like that: Ali, yeah, etc. Um, even David Beckham doesn't yeah. have that same following. So, at any rate, um, I think there's that bigotry. And then I also think kung fu. Uh, in you know, sort of higher brow culture is considered something low brow. Sure. Uh, and so, because he was a, I always joke if Bruce Lee had been a poet who had converted like twenty million people into Chinese like calligraphy, yeah, there would be five books about him. Yeah. But because he was a kung fu martial artist, and that's considered just slightly above horror, sure, as a genre, um, he's he's treated as someone who's not a major cultural figure, and I think that's why it went that way. And then finally, I would say. Um, the estate has enjoyed a lot of control over his image. Yeah. Particularly, you were just off earlier saying about Dragon, the Bruce Lee movie. That's right. That was Linda, based on Linda Lee's book. Yeah. And then that was the only thing out there for the longest time. That's and right. And so um, over the years, they haven't been, they haven't, let's put it this way, they haven't gone out of their way to try to get an independent biography ready. Yeah. <laughs> They've enjoyed the fact that her Linda's version of who her husband was, which she has every right to tell, is was the only one out there. Yeah, yeah. So that picks up on a very good point because this is an unauthorized right. biography. 
But having said that, um, you've got original interviews there. You've met Linda, you met with Shannon, yeah. uh, you met with the Lee family in your research for this. So was there any pushback from the estates, the Bruce Lee estates, with regards to this book? Or were they fully, it sounds like they were fully cooperative with doing the book. Yeah, they, um, I, first I want to say I really admire Linda. Yeah. She's gone through two horrific tragedies, mm-hmm. uh, losing a husband and a son. Yeah. Uh, and she has every right to be off the wall and yep. she's a completely honorable decent human being when you meet her and Shannon is quite lovely as well and has done a a, a strong job holding the estate together yeah uh i went in with a book project in hand saying i already have a biography they're already going to pay me i'm going to do it no matter what fine so i wasn't asking their permission yeah um and we sat down and and basically the estate's position over the years has been they never work with someone who's going to talk about Bruce's death. Yes, yes. Um, and the way I sort of joke about it is the Elvis estate will never do anything. It will never release any photos of Elvis during his fat period. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. It stops, doesn't it, at yeah. a certain point. Yeah, yeah. so uh, every estate has its own little quirk, the thing they don't really want to talk about. Yeah. And so Shannon, very honestly, was like, we're... Uh, we're we don't like talking about his death. Yeah. And I said, well, it's a 600 page book. I can't yeah. skip it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the one question that everyone yes, asks about. That's really. the thing. So they very kindly granted the interviews. And then after a while, I think they felt like, um, I was going to delve into topics they were less comfortable with. And mm. so we amicably parted ways. Okay. So okay. they, so I haven't talked to them since then, and uh, yeah, and yeah. they, they, I think quite politely have just not responded to the book. Yeah, I was going to say, way. have you had any feedback at all from mm. them on the book or, or anything? Not no, to... you hear things around the edges from sure. various people, but they've officially not said anything, and um, and I understand because when you're digging into somebody's closet a few skeletons pop out exactly yes and who who wants there to find out something about their father they didn't know about yes right yeah Yeah. and so you feel like i personally as the biographer was like i wasn't looking it just popped out what do you want me to do i mean i can't skip it so you're in a tough position so i understand that uh, uh i think the honorable thing is to be like Hey, we have our version. He has his version. Sure, sure. Each his way. Did you come at this with a particular angle in mind that you wanted to take? Or were you just approaching it, trying to be non-biased, just like, I'm going to hit the research and then see what portrait of this man sort of conjures up? Right. So that's a great question. And one of the things I thought about is I what I did is I read everything that had ever been written by Bruce Lee, yep. which has turned out to be a lot. Yeah. And uh, the best books were actually the first two. Um, Alex Ben Block's yes. uh, uh, The Legend of Bruce Lee and Don Atoyo and F- Felix Dennis's yeah. King of Kung Fu. Yeah. And that's because they had no idea who Bruce Lee was. Mm-hmm. And they sort of approached it openly as like a reporter. Like, let's go figure out who this... He's famous. Yeah. He's in this movie, but we've never heard of him. Yeah. And I wanted to approach him that way. If I had any uh, sort of angle or edge, I felt like um, just inevitably the Western English language versions of Bruce focused on his life after he came back from Hong Kong when he was 18. Yeah. Because those people are easier to talk to yeah. if you don't speak Mandarin sure. or Cantonese. And I speak Mandarin and have a, uh, I spent two years in China. And so I felt like that was something I could bring to a story. Yeah. So the one thing I wanted to make certain of was that I got his childhood. And that, for me, once I... Probably the most seminal moment or the, the biggest experience changing my perspective was when I went to Hong Kong and I went to the Hong Kong Film Archives and I sat in there for like six days and just watched all 20 of his childhood movies. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and the Mandarin ones I could understand. The yeah. Cantonese ones that they were Less so sad. bad they didn't even translate them yeah. into Mandarin was yeah. tough. But what you realize was like, oh my God, he's an actor. Yeah. Like, he's yeah. an actor. And Kung Fu was a later passion that yeah. then emerged yeah. and became a Kung Fu actor. But he was playing comedies and melodramas. He was Macaulay Culkin. He was the scrappy orphan. Uh, he, play, he did a James Dean version character, Rebel Without a Cause, yeah. called The Orphan. And when you see those movies, then you realize the versatility. And it also made me think, 
Um, if he had continued to live, we would have gotten to see those things as well, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. He'd have done some silly comedy action. Yeah. And he'd have done like some like romance action. Sure. And then he might have dropped the action and just done a straight romance if yeah. it had worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you would have seen... So Bruce Lee wouldn't have just been considered just kung fu the yeah. way we do because... Almost everybody only watches those four last four movies. Yes. You touch on an interesting point there with the cultural difference between the East and the West mm. and the perceptions of Bruce Lee since he died. I just, I mean, even during Bruce Lee's lifetime, he sort of struggled with this, didn't he? Right. Uh, he was too American to be accepted in, in, in China. China have, have sort of adopted Bruce Lee quite late. You know, the statue in yes. Hong Kong was only unveiled, what, 10 years ago or something? Yeah, yeah. What do you think the reason was for, for that, that late acceptance? So I think what's interesting about him after his death is that in Hong Kong, in Southeast Asia, Taiwan, he was the biggest star in the world. Yeah. He was bigger than the Beatles. And he was almost completely unknown in the West. Yeah. So the West, after Enter the Dragon, fell in love with him. And Hong Kong actually became disillusioned. Yeah. His star declined um, because his death was mired in scandal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also he'd built himself with this kind of heroic image. And so to die from maybe an aspirin in a yeah. woman's apartment, it was just was a shabby death. Yeah. Uh, and you could see also have it, the estate, Linda having gone through that experience, why she doesn't like to talk about it. Mm. Um, and so uh, they sort of fell out of love with him at the same time the West was falling in love with yeah. him. And so you could actually see the divergence. Um, and so what changed was mainland China, which was completely closed yep. until the late 80s and opened up in the 90s, at some point r decides it wants to reclaim Bruce Lee as a Chinese hero. Yeah. And it comes out with the uh, the CCTV, state-run TV version, 50-part series. I think The Legend of Bruce Lee is the translation. That's right, yes. In yeah, 2008. Yeah. yeah. And it's the biggest hit state TV's ever had. Sure. And I have young, like, I have some students at Yale who will come up to me who are from mainland China, and they're like, I saw it, I loved it, what'd you think of it? And I'm like, it's terrible. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost unwatchable, yeah. mate, I don't know what you're talking about. But at that time, it was sort of state-of-the-art TV in mainland China. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and when that happened, then Hong Kong decided, oh, we've, we've got some, let's revitalize yeah. his image. Yeah. And so I think it was very pragmatic, as yeah. you would expect from the Hong Kongese, um, to uh, to sort of revitalize Bruce as well as part of their tourist attraction. Yeah. And so when I was in Hong Kong in 2013 for the 40th anniversary of his death, um, you know, you just saw truckloads or busloads of mainland tourists who would come up to the Bruce Lee statue, stand in front of him, do the pose. And so... Uh, that's completely... None of these people knew who Bruce Lee was because they couldn't see his movies until yeah, of course. until the mid-90s. So that's what happened. Yeah. The perception, it seems, is that, um, you know, when he went off to Hollywood, that that was, that was what corrupted him in a way. But you're saying now, no, this it's, there is a more of an acceptance in China of, of him and, and who he was. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what it is is there was, there's a hunger in mainland China for Chinese heroes. Yeah. And because they want to be a superpower, uh, someone who has iconic status across the world yeah. is useful to them. Yeah. Uh, and also, I think what's interesting about Lee as an archetype is he presages a more muscular Chinese image. Yeah. Uh, and the kind of stereotype up until that point was the head down, bowed, you know, Houseboy, working the pigtail, all of those kind of horrible stereotypes. And Lee comes in with a, almost like a rapper yeah. with a swagger, right? <laughs> he attitude? walks on screen with an attitude, yeah. sort of chest back, plus yeah. forward. And that's who he was in person. But on screen, he just presented the Chinese male in a different way. Yeah. And you can see that's part of the reason Hong Kongese fell in love with him, but that's also sort of what mainland China wants to represent now. Yeah. How much of that from Lee's part was intentional? Or do you think, because what comes across strong, strongly in the book is that he was very much an individualist. Like He, he very much champions the, um, you know, be the, be the best you can be. Whether he was 
aiming for a particularly strong nationalism mm. to me is is unclear i'm just wondering what 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 you think think about that well i think lee's interesting um because he's eurasian yeah and so he was discriminated growing up uh, the story told in the book is when ip Man's students got frustrated with him because yeah. he was kind of a cocky kid yeah uh they tried to kick him out based on the fact that he wasn't full chinese mm. and i know living in china that um that's called mixed blood yeah. um, is there's some subtle prejudice that goes on there and then of course he comes to America and he's discriminated against and I think what's interesting about Bruce is he's a post-racial figure in the sense that he appeals across racial lines yeah. but his way was not to deny any of his heritage but to be proud of it wherever he was so when he was in America he he was really proud about being Chinese yeah. and he played it up and he, he did our Chinese things. And then he went back to Hong Kong and he was really proud about his Americanness. Yeah. And when he had a beard and they were like writing things about yeah. it that he, I thought was this great moment. This, yeah. this beard becomes a controversy. Um, he's like, I think there's going to be way more beards because I'm doing it. He doesn't yeah. back off at all. And so he managed to um, never deny his mixed heritage um, but also sort of strive for a post-racial thing. And that's what I think is interesting about him as a person. And I, I think he just got into the movie. Those movies he made just because they were the ones that were there. Yes. Right. Yes. I don't think he was particularly into Chinese nationalism at all. No. I think he was uh, mostly apolitical. Mm. Um, I think he possessed the... He was like... You meet somebody and they have the typical sort of resentments of their country. Yeah. So he was a little resentful of the Brits for yeah. having all the money and being in control of Hong Kong. Yeah. And he was a little resentful of the Japanese because yeah. of the war and yeah. what his parents told him about that experience. Um, but And so in those movies, it's not that he's faking the like Japanese thing, um, but they're clearly playing it up. Yeah. And, and if yeah. they give him a movie where he was like mad at the Russians, yeah. he'd have played that one well too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, he, and, and it's important to understand when he had a chance to write his own movie, he said it in Italy with this kind of fake mafia. That's right. Um, Fist of Fury wasn't his project. Yeah. He was just a pay, he was a contract actor yes. at that point. He's in America in the 1960s, height of the civil rights movement. There's so much political you know Vietnam there's so much going on but you don't it doesn't seem as if any of that had any yeah. impact or Im effect on his life yeah yeah and so that's one of the interesting things I asked um, Linda that specifically mm. um, because if you're a writer and someone's going through an era you want them to be sort of part of what was going on. Yeah. Um, and she almost seemed embarrassed, but she was like, no, we didn't read the newspaper. We didn't pay attention to the news. Um, and I think, you know, my parents were very conservative, and I never heard anything about any of these movements from them either. Yeah. And I think what it is is 10% of the American population was very engaged in the civil rights movement and yeah. the protests and whatever and 90% could care less and was just going about their lives yeah. and Bruce was the 90%. The one thing I do think was interesting about him is when he got to Hollywood he did pick up a little bit on the hippie counterculture. Sure. Which is like he would wear dashikis he'd smoke a little pot Yeah. Uh, and his philosophy in many ways the um, Cheat Kunto, uh, Jita Krishnamurti, was very much a kind of um, 60s yeah. anti-tradition, yeah. anti-establishment kind of viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, there's a great quote from Dan Inocento where he says something like, it was the 60s, everyone talked like this. Yeah, that's right, yeah. because, uh, you know, the Bruce had on the wall, like, using no way is way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Having no limit is limitation. Uh, and Bruce was pulling from Zen. What's interesting about him is because he was, he was, he was, he's a Eurasian, born in America, raised in Hong Kong. He was pulling different uh, traditions together. Um, and so he's pulling kind of Zen Buddhism via Alan Watts, a British yeah. philosopher, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and he's also, you know, doing Jitta Krishnamurti, who's this kind of new age figure who comes out of the, the Theosophic Society. So yeah. all this kind of weird things are like swirling around in his head. Yeah. I just felt oftentimes when I talked to people, it was like Bruce was that guy in sophomore year in college who you go get high with <laughs> and like talk about these deep ideas. Yes. Uh, yes. And I think he just sat around with Coburn and yeah. Silifant after they had their workout yeah. and just like rapped. Yeah. 
that like I think he like well the silent flute certainly has that yeah, 60s doesn't it? high yeah. kind of um, transcendental vibe to it yeah um, but that's interesting because uh, <clears throat> the perception of Bruce Lee is this very nowadays a very deep thinker philosophical um, I know even at the time he said that he studied philosophy but he, he obviously he didn't major in philosophy <laughs> he took two classes he took, he took two classes <laughs> I, when it I got his transcript uh, yeah. he was a drama student I got his transcript and I was like he took intro so, yeah. 101 to philosophy <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but yeah. yeah but it's interesting how that could sort of help his cause in a way in the, in yeah. the philosophy the way that he was he was teaching do you think it was that calculated or was he genuinely uh, you know a deep thinker like that um he he was an autodidact which is yeah. interesting he was a terrible student you put him in a sort of uh, you know a formal setting he just it couldn't accept authority or being told what to read yeah but if he was allowed to pick what to read he was very passionate about it and so um some of the people i interviewed were like you know, I think it was kind of a con. He knew that there was a bunch of hippy dippy white celebrities who were into this Eastern mysticism, and he could be like Mr. Yeah. Guru to sure. them. Um, but the the fact is, he had like 500 books on philosophy that yeah. he edited and noted. And uh, one of his girlfriends said something I thought was fascinating, where she said Sharon Farrell said, "You know, when he would talk about this." you know, be like water thing. I just didn't get that and I would ignore him. And the image I had in my mind is some guy who's just so into this, he talks about it all the time. Yeah. Even to people who aren't interested. And that to me is, you know, it's like your nerd friend who will talk yeah. about a subject. I don't know, maybe you, but you know, when you get into something <laughs> yeah, and you're yeah. like, you go on and on and on, that's genuine. So sure. I think it was both. I think he was genuinely interested, but he was also smart enough to know that his genuine interest had commercial benefit. Yeah. And the Be Like Water, they were Sterling Silliphant's words. They were, you know, in, in Longstreet, weren't they? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in retrospect, all this stuff is attributed to Bruce Lee, but it's not necessarily... Yeah, so that, I mean, one of the moments I think is great is every documentary pulls that clip from the Pierre Burton interview. That's right, yeah. Um, but they cut off the setup, which is like, Sterling Silliphant wrote this thing for you in Longstreet. Yeah. Can, do you remember the line? Yeah. And then as an actor, he says, yes, I remember the line. And then he does the line, but they cut that part off and just do the line as if this is his words. Yes. yes. And and of course, what they're trying to do is create Bruce Lee, the philosoph the enlightened Zen master. Uh, and my sort of view was he was if you give him another thirty or forty years, he might have gotten there. Yeah. But at thirty two, he yeah. was he was a guy with a lot of ideas bouncing around his head and also a lot of materialistic ambitions yes. and other things yeah. and so yeah. um, he, his, his philosophical genius has been overhyped there's that perception of him being this deep thinker and a very serious man but the thing that really comes out in the book is um, he's such a good laugh to be around as yeah. well you know he seemed like a really fun uh, character you know always playing practical jokes yeah. that isn't just based on one or two anecdotes like, it seems like everyone you spoke to yep. had similar stories Along, along those lines. Yeah, yeah, so that's what's interesting, and that's where I, I once I understood him as an actor first, mm. it made sense. Like, he would get in a group of his friends, and he would start doing voices yeah. and telling jokes, and he reminded me of those very extroverted, always-on, kind yeah. of showman-like friends I have who, sure. who are actors. And, and that's... He wasn't the stoic martial arts master who was up on the top of the hill yeah. thinking deep thoughts, although he did like to think deep thoughts. But most of the time, he was a good laugh. Like, mm. people loved being around him. Um, you know, Linda completely fell in love with him because she would be part of the group, and she, he, she talked about how he made her laugh until her stomach hurt. Yeah. Um, and that was his kind of great gift. And what was interesting, though is I think it was all in the delivery because I couldn't find a joke that was genuinely funny when you put it on the page. <laughs> There's like one in the yeah. book that I got down. But um, I think he just like, as the way he told it, and that was his gift as a performer. He could just make, he could get you right into a, move, a moment. Um, and I just, that's why I always think of him as like an actor. He was this, he always on charming yeah, yeah. Uh, good guy to have around was that what were the things that you noticed as you were researching the book and this picture of him was developing did anything what surprised you about him um, 
Well, I actually didn't know about the pot smoking. So, yeah. and and then I was like, oh, it's the sixties, an actor, and you know, you see the like that he had a full length mink coat, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, I've known all sorts of martial artists, and they're not a stereotype. There are like you know very materialistic ones and whatever. Yeah. But you just if someone says this guy has a Porsche and a full length mink coat, is he? a Hollywood actor or is he a Zen martial arts master? <laughs> Which one would you pick, yeah, right? Sure. So that to sure. me, like he he behaved in ways that make perfect sense for a celebrity yeah. um, but are more problematic for um, a martial arts master. Yes, yes. The role of Linda in his life. Yeah. Um, very much overlooked really, isn't she? Yes. Um, I mean, how important was Linda to Bruce's life, would you say? Uh, I think she's overlooked because she was the yin to his yang. He's such a charismatic figure that yeah. people want to focus on him all the time. Yeah. And even when I was working on the book, I would have to go back and be like, I, I'm ignoring her. She needs to be in here more. Yeah. Um, I think she's crucial because he would not have succeeded if he hadn't married her. Yeah. Uh, she was the sort of rock that he relied on. And also having a family early um, gave him a sort of sense of purpose. Yeah. Because he was a bit of a um, well-off toff, yeah. as it were. <laughs> he came from quite a rich yes. uh, upbringing. Which is totally different from the image. Yes, that's right. Um, you know, Dragon, the story... It's be- a rags to riches kind Rags of to riches yeah. story because when Linda met him in Seattle, he was rags. Yes, that's right. Um, he was a, he was working in, in uh, Ruby Chow's restaurant, living in a closet. But that's only because his rich father sent him there to be punished. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he was a rich kid being punished in America. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and that's his story, genuinely. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think what Linda did for him is give him the stability and, and the utter devotion mm. to pursue his dreams. Yeah. And if he had had a wife that was like, you know, you can't pay the mortgage. This acting thing isn't working out. Yes. yes. Which I think a good 50% of the women would have said to him yeah. if he had chosen to marry. Or Amy Sambo, who he dated, who was like, what about my career? Yeah. Um, and if he had had to try to be like, oh, honey, I'll try to see your your new set. Yeah. And he needed, because what he wanted to do was so impossible, he needed an absolute devoted uh, helpmate yeah. as a wife, yeah, and and also someone who could um, stabilize him because he was he was hyperactive and his personality was very volatile, yeah, and he needed someone who was like calmed him, yes, and he had a very traditional outlook and approach to women, particularly I guess the, you know the rise of the sort of second wave of feminism as that's coming into the the sixties. Do you think he bought into that? <laughs> no, that's. I mean, that's why I think the Amy Sambo relationship yeah. is fascinating, because she's like, he just wants to control me, yeah, and I want to go be uh, who I am. It's very hard to explain to a Western audience, but China is a polygamous culture for two thousand years. Yeah, Bruce's grandfather had thirteen concubines. Bruce didn't believe in monogamy. Yeah. He he did not grow up in a culture that believed in monogamy. Mm. And in fact, Western monogamy is a minority view at that time. Sure. But only in Europe and America, all of Asia and all the Muslim world is polygamous. So um, I think Bruce Bruce's attitude was he genuinely was devoted to his wife. He genuinely loved her. He never wanted to hurt her feelings. Yeah. And so he was discreet. Mm. But he didn't feel like he was unfaithful because he didn't buy into a Western Christian monogamous version. Yes. So he was devoted but not faithful. And I I think if you asked him, he wouldn't have considered it cheating. Yeah. I think he just viewed it as like what a guy gets to do. Mm. And that was a very, even in America, there was that kind of madman double standard. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't just Hong Kong, this kind of Don Draper, like, I got my beautiful blonde wife at home she looks yeah. after the kids and I pay for everything and I come home and I kiss her and I'm, I never hurt her and yeah. I'm always good but when I'm out with the boys we do what the boys do yes. and um, but did you put any of this to Linda when you met her because she knew about a lot of these affairs there were I mean there's Thoris Brandt on the Green Hornet Sharon Farrell that we mentioned there during the Marlow years Betty Ting Pei obviously which I'm sure we'll come on to in a sec yes um, 
And he wasn't really discreet about it, was he? Let's be honest. Well, he was discreet enough because I don't think she knew about any of them yeah, but Betty. Yeah, uh, okay. She so, knew about Betty. Obviously. Yeah, well, and she, in her own book, so I'm quoting her, and from 1975 when she writes it, yeah. <clears throat> she wrote, I had never considered whether my, fa- my husband was unfaithful until right after his death when it's revealed that he died in Betty's apartment. Sure, okay. Which means she didn't know about anything up until that point. Yeah. At least yeah. according to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I interviewed her, I had just interviewed Betty, and she held the position that she was not convinced that the... Betty, for years, had not said they were having an affair. Yes, yes. And when I interviewed her was the first time she admitted that to a Western reporter... And I wrote that down yeah. and published it. And Linda talked to me afterwards in order to sort of be like, I don't think that's true. And I, I had a moment where I looked at her and I said, really? Hmm. And she said, well, he was such a good husband. He was so devoted to his kids. I don't think he would have done anything to hurt them. Yeah. And I thought that was a very interesting frame for her to understand things. Yes. Um, because I think that he was. He loved his wife, he loved yep. his kids, and he never would have wanted to do anything to hurt them. Yeah. He just didn't view that as hurting them, as long as it was quiet and off on the yeah. side. Yeah. Um, and so they could both be right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what's yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. about it. I see, I see what you mean. Yeah. And yeah. so it's hard for me because I grew up in Kansas, <laughs> Catholic, conservative. Yeah. Like, it took me a while to get my head around it because, to me, cheating's cheating. Yes. You make a vow and you marry, yeah. then you don't yeah. do this. Yeah. Um, and so it, I had to ask myself, does this make me rethink about Bruce? And, and it was important to put him into context. Yeah. I mean, should it change the way that we see him, or do you just think that that is just part of human nature in a way? No, I think what it what I realized is, um, it's like judging an Aztec for human sacrifice. Like, you can't judge a Hong Kong man from the 1950s for having multiple yeah. affairs because they all did it. Yeah, and and so you're you're imposing a completely alien moral structure on someone else. Now, I happen to think. Monogamy is a superior moral vision. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a relativist. Yeah. Um, but you, when you go back, like or Mormons in the 19th century, they were polygamist. Yeah. Um, you could say that's wrong, but they didn't think so. So that's that's my view, which is he simply didn't believe in monogamy, and he married a woman who did, and he was doing his best to figure out how to na- navigate that. Yeah. <clears throat> and they reached a basic, uh, not uncommon compromise, which is. As long as you don't leave me and as long as you don't put it in my face, I'm okay with this. Yeah. And his his view was, I'll never let this interfere with my family life and yeah. I will keep it on the side. Yeah. But the Betty Ting Pei thing. Yes. So that's where he starts to lose his that's grip That's where he's on losing it. it there. Yeah. So because I didn't realize how long <clears throat> that actually went on for. Yes. Uh, so, you know, they're meeting around the time of uh, even Way of the Dragon. So that's like, what's that, early 72? Yeah. So they must have been seeing each other off and on for a good year and a bit. Then. Yeah, right about a year. You met with Betty Ting Pei. I did. So is she, obviously at the time, hounded by the press? She was the last person to see Bruce Lee alive. Yeah. Did you get a sense from her that she is still very remorseful. What, what's, what's where she at? She feels... Uh, what I thought was interesting, and I'm sure because she was talking to me, she's reliving that moment, yeah. but it's an open wound mm-hmm. for her. Yeah. Um, when I talked to Linda, I felt like I was talking to someone who still very much loves someone, but who had passed away a long time ago. Sure. I mean, and had, had buried them. And, and for Betty, Bruce is still very much alive. Mm. And... And so her emotions were all over the place. Like, But mostly there was a sense of victimization. She kept saying over and again, people kept blaming me. Yeah. You know, what did I do? Like, they like keep blaming me. And, and so if what she's saying is correct. She is just a victim of terrible luck. Yeah. Or, or fate. Yeah. Um, in the sense that he died in her bed, in her apartment, and she got stuck with everybody who was a fan of Bruce Lee saying why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that mm. Mm. Um, but no there's there's no I don't think she feels like there was anything she could have done different yeah and she was open and honest with you she felt that you were you were getting a 
heartfelt, honest response from her? I uh, I did 13 hours wow. of interviews over three days, yeah. of which maybe 45 was about specifically about her relationship with Bruce Lee. Okay. Um, so I think that she was giving me bits and pieces and yeah. still holding stuff back. Yeah. And there are certain elements of the story I it was very frustrating because I couldn't get no you know 13 hours I spent every way possible yeah, as an yeah. interviewer um, and and she would like say I don't want to talk about that or pull it back so um, I think there's still things to be that could be told by her but I also think there's a part of her who likes that people will still come around and talk to her and so part of the reason she holds back is so that she still has a little mystery and thus, sure. thus some value sure there's still so much mystery surrounding uh-huh. Bruce Lee's death. Yes. There's a large portion of the, the book there, yeah. uh, which is dedicated to the day he dies and, and obviously the uh, inquest afterwards, which was resulted in death by misadventure. Yeah, yeah. You have your own theories on Bruce I Lee's do. death. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's not spoilers, maybe. No, do you no. Wanna, it's, it's, uh, we, do you mind talking spoiled. about it? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so... A couple things are important to understand. A, w- a couple revelations occurred for me um, that allowed me to sort of get a grasp over this because yeah. it's a huge mess. And when you read it, you know, there's people I still in Hong Kong. They're like, ah, everyone believes he was killed by the triads. And members, uh, siblings, and I won't name them, believe that Raymond Chow killed him mm. to this day. Yeah. Like people, his, his own family. Yeah. Uh, so it's still a hot issue. And yeah. that's what I thought was interesting is that you know when your own family is divided on why somebody dies that's not a that's not a dead issue it's very alive sure. uh the revelation i had was um raymond chow and betty tingpei the last two people to see him alive raymond his boss Ray, uh, betty his mistress were not trying to cover up how he died they were trying to cover up where he died yeah he died in her apartment they knew that would be a scandal. Raymond Chow had entered the dragon to release. Mm-hmm. He was trying to get the body somewhere else so he could claim that Bruce died at home yeah. with his wife. And once you realize that, then you realize why he did all these things. Mm-hmm. That Bruce was already dead by the time Betty like, went inside to check on him. He, yeah. he had said, I want to go lie down. Yeah. Uh, and so all of this was a charade afterwards yeah. where they're pretending like he's still alive so they can move the body to the hospital. They dress the body as they well. They dress the body as well. Um, and and so that once I got that, I was like, oh, I see what it is. And so everybody's gotten very conspiracy-minded because they know there's something fishy. But yeah. once you understand what the fishiness is, it makes a lot more sense. Sure. The one thing I think for certain is even if they sat down and told us the God's honest truth, their memory isn't quite yeah, ever going to be quite right. So I don't know who called who exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah, first. Yeah. Okay. I think what happened is Raymond called and said, why haven't you still come? Mm-hmm. And she was like, then she checked on him. And yeah. then she came back to the phone yes. and panicked. And said, come over. Come over. Or what are we going to do? Yeah. Um, I don't even think she was fully cognizant of the fact that he was fully dead. Yeah. Like, I think it was just, I think she flipped her mind. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and having talked to her, she's not the person I, if I collapsed and died I, or was about to die, I would want to rely on the call an ambulance. <laughs> <I really> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Raymond, however, made a very calculated choice. And I think what he thought was he could get over there and get him into the hospital on time. And just like he had on May 10th. Yeah. Uh, and that was, I think it was irrelevant. Like, I think Bruce was already dead. Yeah. So I was sitting as far as I am from you with Raymond Chow. Yeah. And I said, why didn't you call the ambulance earlier? Yeah. And he looked at me and he went, <laughs> you're not the first person to ask me that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, you're not going to crack. No. You're not going to, you're not going to tell me. Um, you think there's... There's still stuff that he knows about that day? I think there's stuff he knows about that day. Uh, like, for instance, who was the mysterious person? Yeah, what was that about? There yeah, was yeah. Another, there was, uh, that was the testimony of one of the doctors. The ambulance the scene, driver. The ambulance driver at the scene. So there was someone else in the room. There was a young man in the room who has never been identified to no. this day. And if you read through the transcript, I tried to condense the transcript because it's yeah. 100 pages long. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they actually called both the doctor and Raymond Chow back 
and grilled them on that. And both of them were like, nope, there was no one else. So they they denied it under oath, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was a kind of vivid back and forth. Are you sure? Because the ambulance driver says it was. So there are very details around it that we will never know because Raymond's about uh, to pass away. And I don't think Betty will ever give us full details. Yeah. Um, but I think I got the majority of the story. Yeah. Yeah. The circumstances surrounding how he actually died. Right. You're right. There was an incident in May where he was doing some uh, dubbing Mm -hmm. um, and he passed out that day. The severity of that, there's quite a lot of detail there that I didn't didn't really fully yeah. know either as well that was that was very interesting it reads like an ep- epileptic it fit it yeah. does read like an epileptic fit um, and also in the inquest that didn't uh, come about around his um around heat exhaustion as well. Yeah, exactly. Now, so this this is an interesting theory, which I, I didn't know about. I hadn't heard about this. Yeah, so it's completely new. Yeah. Um, nobody had ever proposed this before. And I spent uh, six months, like, sending the case to various, like, a neurologist at UCLA, one at NYU, forensic mm-hmm. pathologists, because I had no idea. Um, aspirin... Uh, the equagesic theory allergic reaction allergic reaction yeah. but what they're really talking about is allergic reaction to aspirin yeah. um, never seemed very plausible uh, and I thought I was going to have to end my book on like I, yeah. don't, I don't know <laughs> none of the theories are good it's not ninjas but otherwise yeah. I don't know um, but the the two factors that you have in kind of doing the Sherlock Holmes of it is he had cerebral edema, mm-hmm. and there are only certain things that can cause cerebral edema. Mm-hmm. It's not a heart attack, so it's specific what killed him. So what caused the cerebral edema? That narrows your range of possibilities down. And then he had two incidents 10 weeks apart. The first one on May 10th, he collapses and nearly dies of a cerebral edema, but the doctors get to him in time. Mm-hmm. July 20th, he complains of a headache, lies down, and dies before they can get him to a hospital. Mm-hmm. So exactly the same thing, 10 weeks apart. So you assume there has to be some relationship between them. Sure. Um, and on May 10th, he went into a very small dubbing room in Hong Kong on the hottest day of May. And Hong Kong, if you've ever been there, is It's intense. Hot. Yeah. <laughs> that it's place hot. is hot. It's the tropics. Yeah. Uh, and they turn the air conditioning off. And so... Uh, he ends up getting overheated and collapse. And I had read something. There's a British nurse named Alexander Duncan who wrote a book called The Death of Bruce Lee. And he points out that the May 10th event looks very much like heat stroke. And mm. when he said that, I was like, oh, how did we all miss this? Yeah. Um, but how did they miss this? Because so, it doesn't come up, does it? It's, it's, it's all. It's not mentioned in, never, the, in the inquest even. Never. Yeah. Um, I think they also didn't realize um, that he had gotten the sweat glands removed from under his armpits. Exactly. So he, he's had his sweat glands removed. Right. And that was because... Why did he do that? Because he sweated profusely anyway. But it's, that's, yes. Yeah, so that was his way to counter that then. Exactly. Yeah. And apparently that was an operation that was done frequently back in the 70s. Ah, okay. So it was one of those like things that, you know, someday we'll look at Botox and be like, how did those barbarians <laughs> yeah, do that? Yeah, sure. So it's the same yeah. thing. I think someone said, hey, you're sweating too much on screen. It's really annoying. I can, you know, 10 minutes, we'll take care of it, and you'll be totally fine. Yeah. Um, So that happens three months before his first collapse, three or four months. And then 10 weeks later, he has a second collapse. And what what I did was I went back and looked at my interview with Raymond Chow, and I hadn't really paid attention to this part of it, but he says in the interview with me something that he'd never said before, which was it was uncomfortable that day. I didn't feel well. Bruce didn't feel well. Uh, And then he jumped up and started performing scenes from Game of Death, showing Mm. all the kung fu moves. Mm. Uh, And he was very active, and I think this made him a little tired and dizzy. Mm. He took a sip of water and then complained of a headache and went to lie down. And I was like, that's heat stroke. Like, you know, those details... And it had totally laid there until I got the idea, and then I looked at the details, at the evidence again, basically. And I thought that's I thought that was the most convincing theory of all of them. And I basically talked to everyone about every single one, and there's only three that are scientifically possible. One is allergic reaction to that could cause cerebral edema, 
One is allergic reaction to aspirin. One is epileptic seizure. Mm. And the third is heat stroke. Yeah. Uh, and that's really the... You, there's nothing else that I could find that would explain the cerebral edema. Yeah, yeah. Not a ninja then. Not a ninja, <laughs> although I, I hear they have cerebral edema powers. <laughs> Towards the end of his life, I mean, you know, he's 32 years old. It's no age, is it? Yeah. Um, but his health had suffered, hadn't it? And particularly during the filming of Enter the Dragon. Right. Through not sleeping, being stressed. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't a particularly healthy man by the end was he yeah so that's i have to say this one of the things uh, that linda said to me i thought was interesting is she said everybody says that he didn't look well but he looked fine to me mm. um, so there is a counterfactual of mm. someone saying this is not true but everybody else said he looked pale his yeah. skin looked gray he didn't look good mm. um i think two things happened one the initial collapse hurt him more profoundly than people realized. Yeah. Uh, but then the second thing was when he died, his mother said it was overwork. And that's too simple, but in a way, I think his mother was right. Yeah. Which is the kind of personality it took to get Bruce Lee to the point where he was the first Asian American to ever star in a Hollywood movie was the same personality that couldn't take a break yeah. when he needed to the most. Yeah. And if there's a moral to the story, he was a man willing to pay the ultimate price to achieve his ambition. Yeah. Um, and that his greatest strength was his biggest vulnerability, yes. which was he just needed, when he first collapsed, to go to Antigua and hang out <laughs> on the beach. Just chill out for a bit. Yeah. And recover. Yeah. And he didn't. And what yeah. happened was he lost 20 pounds, which for 145 pounds. 40 pound guys a lot yeah and he basically uh did was stop sleeping because he was so amped up about all the opportunities that were coming and he yeah. was going to seize this moment and and then i think fate did the rest yeah he yeah. made himself vulnerable um and then you know it's yeah. like you're driving the car fast yeah 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 <laughs> it's not your fault that it slides off yeah. the road but if you'd been going slower it wouldn't have happened sure that's sure. what i think happened you can see that in those last fight scenes he's filming with Sammo Hung, Star to Lens of the Dragon. He's a skinny guy there. He's zero body fat on him, isn't there? He doesn't look like he didn't weigh the dragon. No. Right. And that's my that was my reaction when yeah. Linda said that. I was like, oh, look, I can look at the film. Yeah. Like we, well, his body shape changes within such a short space of time. Yeah. You know, his um, physique, his face shape. You've mentioned in your book there about steroids as well. Yes. Which I thought was interesting. I hadn't even really thought about that as a, a, a as a thing but you're in a lot of your your research he was into alternate therapies yes but there's no real evidence of that no there? so tom bleaker uh who was linda's ex-husband yeah uh, wrote a book on subtle matters in which he made a lot of accusations that he didn't support sure um and one of them was about steroids and because bruce's body changed so much i think a lot of people just glommed onto that like of course yeah and of course the time frame fits because steroids sort of took off in the late 60s and yeah. 70s and bruce had all the bodybuilding magazines uh the reason two reasons why which is steroids make you big and puffy like arnold schwarzenegger yeah. but bruce was ripped yeah. and tight yeah uh, and then the second issue was Bruce could not shut his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> if he had something that was cool that he was doing, he talked about it. Yeah. Um, so, and steroids weren't considered a bad thing then. Yes. So there was no reason to be ashamed of steroids in 1971 yeah. because they were legal. Yeah. And everyone who was into bodybuilding used them without any apology. So not, he never mentioned it once to anybody. Yeah. And Bruce didn't, Bruce, you know, he talked about putting electrodes on his head and running electricity through his yeah. body and, and drinking cow's blood. Yeah. So if he had taken steroids and it had made him big, he'd have told all his friends. Yes. Yeah. So those are the two reasons why I don't think it happened. Was there anyone that really surprised you that you were really taken, taken with when you, when you met them? Uh, I thought uh, John Saxon was really charming. Okay. You know, he just had, first off... 
you know, people talk about movie stars and they, they're they having something else. John Saxon's was like 74. He's one of the best looking men I've ever yeah. met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he just was cool, you know, and he yeah. just had something about him that was like, whatever it is that makes someone like a, a movie actor. And John Saxon's not the world's biggest star, but I was impressed by that. Uh, he had a very funny moment where he was talking and he said, don't tell Linda this. <laughs> and then he, he tells me the story about how there were like cute girls on set. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was funny that about was funny. John. He knew pretty quickly he wasn't the star of Enter the Dragon as much as he was sort of conned into believing that he would be. So that was another great revelation. One of the things I looked for with Bruce was I realized he was a highly rational actor. Yeah. Even though he had a hot temper, yeah. um, he was very calculated in what he did. And one of the things I couldn't figure out was all the Americans, when they talked about how Bruce was on End of the Dragon, talked about how difficult he was. That he'd gotten, that he'd fired the screenwriter, yeah. that he'd yelled at Fred Weintraub, yeah. that he wanted to change stuff, that he was like, he didn't come on set the first 10 days. Yeah. Um, and bo- boycotted, basically. Yeah. And the interpretation was, ah, Bruce got a big head. Mm. He had become a star and he was flexing his muscle. And what I realized was that wasn't it at all. What it was was he was terrified that Weintraub and Warner Brothers were just going to film this film in Hong Kong, go back to Hollywood and recut it so that Roper, John Saxon, was the star. Sure. And the Green Hornet, he was going to end up as frickin' Cato again. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he thought they were going to do to him. Yeah. And he was right to believe that because Fred Weintraub had promised John Saxon that he was going to be the star yeah. to get him on the plane, yeah. and they would have cut. They would have made Bruce Lee the number two. And the yeah. other thing I realized would they was, have done? Do you think they would have done that if they if if it had tested? Yeah, not on purpose. Mm-hmm. Like, and this is why you know Hollywood, in a certain sense, that that old line, "The only color they see is green." Yeah, they had tested that, and if Bruce Lee hadn't done well in Glendale. They'd have, they'd have recut it and they'd have shown the version where John Saxon is the star who yeah. comes there and does all the fights. Yeah. And if that had done better, that would have run. Yeah. And they wouldn't have thought twice about it. Yeah. They'd have been like, hey, we let you be number two. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right? Yeah. So Bruce knew this and that's what he was fighting for. And and so Saxon told me the story that I put in the book where Bruce calls him to his house and says, show me your sidekick and then he goes let me show you mine and Bruce knocks him across the room lands into a chair the chair collapses Saxon's on the floor he looks up Bruce comes over and Saxon says don't worry I'm not hurt and Bruce says I'm not worried about you you broke my favorite chair and in the interview I said to John so when did you know you weren't going to be the star of the movie and he goes that was the moment that was the moment that was the moment I knew so Fred Weintraub just jumps off the page as well. Yes. Um, so, who's sadly no longer with us. Yeah. Um, w- he seems like quite. A, he, he was quite a character. Oh, he's a mensch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's like he's, yeah. he's the true mensch, yeah. which is I came to interview him, and his dog was running around. He was sitting there. And he's got this big belly, and he's yeah. got a younger wife, and he lives in Beverly Hills, and he's still got a bunch of money, um, and. Uh, and I mentioned Kelsey, mm-hmm. which is the movie that he, a screenplay that he tried to get made with Bruce in it. Yeah. And I picked this up from like something in obscure. And he was like, no one's ever asked me about that. And from that moment on, he thought I was the best. Like yeah. he'd, he'd gotten, yeah, it was like this new talent he'd found. Yeah. So he found the screenplay for Kelsey. And he, and whenever I had trouble interviewing someone like John Saxon initially didn't want to talk to me. Yeah which I don't blame him, um, Weintraub called him up and was like, talk to the kid. And so he really, uh, he helped me with all of these things. And I, I just felt like um, when he passed, there was a real sadness because uh, he was one of those great, like, uh, reminded me a little of, do you ever watch Entourage? Yeah, Entourage, yeah. He yeah. was a little like Ari Emanuel. Yeah, sure. Okay. Like the agent. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, he would like blow like up fixer. At the fixer, but <laughs> yeah. yell and scream and whatever, and yeah, then yeah. be like, "I love you, let's hug it yeah, out." Yeah. Like he was, he was that kind of guy, yeah. and he was yeah. somebody who would tell you, "I'm going to make you the star," and then 
tell that guy I want to make him the star yes, and then exactly. say I'm going to fire the screenwriter yeah. and then tell yeah. the screenwriter don't show up but he made it work and he was he was a <laughs> mensch even though he was like a total producer con yeah. artist but he did have Bruce Lee's back to be fair didn't he like all those years he was he was trying to you know for kung fu and yeah. like trying he was trying to find the vehicle for him wasn't he well that's what I think was interesting about him is that he was a talent manager first before yeah. he became a producer and he, and I Sometimes when you interview people in person, you get a sense of how they interact with you. Mm. gives you a sense of who they were. And he treated me like a new talent yeah. that he wanted to help. Yeah. And I think he had that instinct of a talent manager. And he saw in Bruce this talent that was untapped. And because he had no sort of racial bias, yeah. he saw, like, oh, who cares if the guy's Chinese? Yeah. Um, and... And so he, he actually went through three different projects trying to find something that would work for Bruce. Yeah. When somebody else, lots of other people gave up on Bruce. Yeah, yeah. And true. so that's why I think he's special is um, there is no Bruce Lee without Enter the Dragon, and there's no Enter the Dragon without Fred Weintraub. Yeah, yeah. Everyone seems to have a lot of nice stuff to say about Bruce. Sure. Um, I wrote down a comment from someone where he was described as a... Uh, what was it? It was like a smart ass, uh, self centered arsehole. Yeah. I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I that mean, was Ruby Chow's son. And I like that because the Chinese, when they hate you, they hate you forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even he caveats that with something like, but at the end of the day, he did do he, a lot for yes. um, you know, the perception of Chinese within film, right. within the wider world. Right. But on the whole, everyone's still very revered look up to Bruce Lee yeah I think so um, I mean inevitably when you come around with the, with your recorder um, people tend to give you the best version sure right um, and also uh, the people who hated him have sort of faded away yeah that's always one of the things you worry about when you write a book is like because I like Bruce Lee kind of inherently um, if, if that's not obvious by now yeah. <laughs> um, uh, do you lean towards that are you being fair are you yeah. getting both sides yeah. or whatever which is yeah. what brings me back to the start of the conversation in what side of Bruce Lee do you show uh, if you're coming at it already an established you know Bruce Lee fan the temptation there is to just right. sort of siphon off this bit. We'll leave that bit on the cutting, yeah, cutting yeah. room floor and we'll focus more on this. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess that's the conflict of being a biographer anyway. Isn't yeah. It? Uh, well, we, uh, and that's why at the end of the day, this is my version of Bruce Lee. Sure. Um, I think it's the best one that's been, at least the most comprehensive that's been done. Um, but somebody could, you know, 10 years from now will come up with one that they'll have a slightly different take. One of the issues that I, uh, friends of mine in the industry, uh, martial artists have criticized me for is they think I was too kind about Bruce Lee's uh, martial arts ability. Mm, okay. uh, that I spent, you know, too much time quoting his disciples or students who yep. think he's, you know, the best thing ever, yep. which is what most students do, and not enough quoting... Um, the karate champions like mm. Joe Lewis and mm. Mike Stone and Chuck Norris to a lesser extent who were like, yeah, Bruce was interesting. He had some interesting ideas, but we could have kicked his ass. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I felt like I included that, but mm -hmm. but it was one of those issues which still comes up like... Yeah. Well, is, he never it, fought he in never, the same like, no, open he didn't. tournaments that, like Chuck Norris was doing. Exactly. Um, and his view was point fighting was kind of silly yeah. and had too many rules yeah. which he was right about yeah. and their point was yeah but you didn't try and they're right about that yeah, as well that's true. Yeah. and Bruce but Bruce was really a performer so yeah I think I think you're I think that's a fair knock which is um, there are people who have a much more skeptical view of Bruce Lee um, Davis Miller who wrote the Tao of Bruce Lee yeah um, offers a much more sort of skeptical view of who he was and much more critical of his um, mm -hmm. personality. And I think that um, my overall view is uh, more forgiving. But it's pretty universally recognized that Jeet Kune Do is one of the earliest forms of mixed martial arts, or at least a system, not a style. Uh -huh. uh, Bruce Lee would have ha hated that. Hated, yeah, yeah. style. Yeah. Uh, but um, as a hybrid system, you know, it is a forerunner for today's mixed martial arts. It is. I mean, that's pretty universally acknowledged. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what Bruce did 
that I think was special to him, and partly I think because he was a Eurasian who was born in America and raised in Hong Kong, is he didn't feel as attached to Chinese tradition as some other, like Wong Jack Man. Sure. Uh, and he got over here and he had a very sort of practical eye. And because he was training not young Chinese kids, but he was training a bunch of street fighters yeah. who were American, yeah. um, they were showing him what they could do. Yeah. And I think he looked at them and he could dominate them, but I'm sure he thought, hmm, his footwork's pretty good. Yeah. You know, this is actually a little harder than it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what he, he picked up was Western combat martial arts. Yeah. Uh, and. I think for a long time, uh, people who were into martial arts had the snobbish view that boxing and wrestling Mm. weren't a martial art, but Mm. they absolutely are. They're a version of it in a sport context. Uh, And he picked up, he looked at Ali in the ring and was like, that guy's a bad dude. Uh, And so he started studying the boxers and he... And he realized some things that boxing, Western boxing, did that was superior to what the Eastern martial arts did. And I think the primary thing was footwork. Yeah. Um, the karate guys were like, this. their whole idea was to be grounded to the earth yeah. so they couldn't be moved. And one of the reasons why I think this is, is because traditional Eastern martial arts was weapons-based. Yeah. Um, and so if you're holding a sword... Yeah. Like, you don't want to move. And so their unarmed combat was based out of their weapons combat. Mm. But if you actually take all weapons out, being rooted to the earth with only your hands is a mistake. Yeah. And so that's one of the things I think happened, which is um, traditional martial arts, when the weapons went away, um, had some flaws, Eastern martial arts. And they were... you can expose that by you know things like boxing and so bruce was very good at figuring out what was wrong when he first goes to america his vision his dream is to open up different schools become a martial arts instructor that was that's what he wanted to do yeah so the film stuff does does come further down the line yes and it sounds like uh, by the end he was he was doing it for the money really yeah teaching you mean teaching yeah yeah But how serious do you actually think he was about being a teacher? Because what does sort of strike me is that he's meeting all these people, Judo Jean LaBelle, uh, Danny Nassanto, he's taking the best things that they're giving him in order to make himself better. There's another telling scene when he first teaches Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and the first thing he's thinking is, we need to be in a movie together. He's not thinking, I'm going to make you a really great martial artist. So, do you think that was important to him, like his students becoming really great martial artists, or was he more just like gathering and just learning for himself? Well, that's why one another reason why I think he was an actor first. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also think he was a young man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and when I was twenty four, I wasn't thinking about other people very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I think it was one of those things where he got into teaching because this was an opportunity to share his culture and to make a little money and yeah. also be in charge, and it was way better than bus and tables yes but it wasn't what he ultimately loved yeah and what he ultimately loved was being the center of attention and being an actor yeah and he combined that with being a great martial artist and so his first passion was to become the world's you know biggest star and also the best martial artist yeah and helping other people came third or fourth <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean yeah. like he was he was a loyal friend he was a good friend he did teach people um, and I, he did help them but that but he that was not his primary goal and even his students who love him were like you know Jesse was a better teacher you know sure, Jesse sure. was more patient yeah. and uh, or they'd say James was more patient or yeah. they would say Dan and Asanto taught more classes than yes. Bruce did yeah. so it's a fairly even the people who loved him very universally said like you know Bruce hung out with you so you would make him better yeah and in the process you learn things but it wasn't he wasn't sitting that wasn't there worried his focus. no he wasn't yeah. worried about your development sure. he was worried about his own it's easy to sort of make these predictions and a lot of people do uh, with regards to what Bruce Lee would have done yeah uh, had he lived longer what are your thoughts around that? Um, it, yeah, it's one of the fun speculation games yeah. because uh, it's like if Marilyn Monroe had lived or yeah. James Dean. That's why he's iconic, by the way. Yeah. Um, if he had lived to be 90, he'd still be a huge star, but you're never an icon yeah. unless you die young. Yes. That's a, it's almost a requirement. Yeah. Um, so 
I the thing that struck me was that he wanted to be a bigger star than Steve McQueen, but he was actually following Clint Eastwood's playbook. Yeah, by going. Uh, Clint Eastwood be, made the spaghetti westerns mm-hmm. that made him a star Bruce Lee told people I'm gonna use Hong Kong like he used Italy bounce back to Hollywood yeah. which is two important points one is Hong Kong was always back up Yes. It was never his first choice. Yeah. Um, he was only using them to get back to Hollywood. That's right. That was another thing that came through as well, that he sort of was using Hong Kong, really, wasn't he? He yeah. didn't want to go back there. No. Uh, he just and, he did, he did, and it wasn't even that he thought Hollywood was treating him that badly at that point. Yeah. Because yeah. Longstreet had worked. Yeah. We just needed some cash. He yeah. went for a quick cash and then suddenly it turned into this big this thing. thing. Um, so I... I my little fantasy, if I'm writing the fictional account of Bruce Lee who lives to be 80, is Bruce Lee is Clint Eastwood. Yeah. He's, he acted and he did like, you know, Enter the Dragon 6 and that yeah. didn't work. <laughs> and so he tries a comedy. Yeah. And then he bounces around. Um, but I think the thing that struck me was the happiest moment of his adult life, other than, a, you know, getting married and having children, yeah, yeah. Um, was filming Way of the Dragon. Yeah. Uh, because it, his most def- one of his two or three most defining qualities, besides being competitive, was wanting to, and needing to be in control. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason he hated authority is because then he wasn't in control. Yeah, which is yeah. probably tied to his father's opium addiction. Yeah, da 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 da. But that um, that. When he was in control, he was really good boss. Yeah. And that's the thing I also thought I admired about it. Everyone pointed out, they were like, he was a total jerk to, yeah. <laughs> to his bosses. Yeah. But he was really good to everyone beneath yeah. him. Yeah. And when he was running the set of Way of the Dragon, he was happy. And he was in charge. And he was good at it. And I think he would have loved being a producer-director. Yeah. And making, you know, his he filming Unforgiven, the kung fu version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And being the star of it. Yeah. And, and I think he would have done more more of that because he just really uh, more than anything else he hated being told what to do yeah. and being in charge would have mattered yeah. and he was and even on the set of Enter the Dragon you're right he's giving the producers a hard time but he's having lunch with all the stunt guys yeah and yeah. the stunt guys love him and yeah. they adore him and they'll follow him anywhere yeah. and he was I called him a good gang leader like mm. he's a guy who you know as long as you were following him he was the best but yeah. if you were challenging him or trying to put him down then you had a problem yeah um, but for everybody who was like his wife or his students or the stuntmen, they just adored Bruce because he was he was a good boss. Yeah. 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 Finally, the most defining Bruce Lee moment. Is it a uh, maybe a part of one of his films? You know, the one I will never forget is when in Way of the Dragon, when he's alone uh, and he's just cracking his sort of body yeah. and he does the V yes I don't know why that sticks with me because that I'm not sure that's defining of who he is but if I had, it's the it's one the image moment. that came to mind was him when he does that yeah. and he looks like a, a like a cobra yeah as the lats come out yeah. and you just because for me being a skinny bullied kid Bruce Lee looked like someone who I could be because he was a small scrawny guy who clearly had just worked out so much that he'd become this. Yeah. And so for me, that's who Bruce Lee is, is he's the underdog who became the badass. Yeah. Uh, and that's why he's iconic mm. because he exemplifies that sort of arc. He's like Achilles. Like yeah. he, he's the, he's the modern warrior, but as the scrawny little kid who just through sheer effort becomes this, deadly dude yeah Uh, and that's why I think that's why his legend lives on yeah yeah and it continues to this day it it? does and has us talking about it yeah 40 odd years after he died exactly Matthew thank you so much you wrote a tremendous book ah well thanks for having me it's a real honor to be here Matthew Polly there really fascinating conversation that with Matthew I very much enjoyed chatting to Matthew Polly I do hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation there from our archive check out the links in the description of this video to find out more about Matthew Polly and this podcast if you do like what you have just heard then please do like the show tell a friend write a comment subscribe to our YouTube channel and subscribe to the Kung Fu Movie Guide podcast wherever it is that you get 
your podcasts. Thank you all so much for your support and for listening to this conversation. Until we meet again, do take care and bye for now. Bye.